Good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, event which features Professor Arthur C. Brooks, uh, President of the uh, American Enterprise Institute, who I think is speaking this morning much more in his uh, capacity as an author and as a scholar, uh, uh, talking not so much about the Enterprise Institute as such, but about the notion of happiness, the notion that nations can factor happiness into their objectives, their planning, their strategy. It's a seductive idea. Bhutan, our great small neighbor, uh, made this singular contribution to uh, the notion of uh, governance and uh, His Majesty King Jigme Wangchuk is the person credited with first putting forward the idea which has subsequently been elaborated and uh, I understand from the very exhaustive notes that the super efficient Mr. Basu, who is really the, the de facto chief executive of Aspen India in India, uh, puts together that the four pillars of the notion of uh, global, um, of, is it global? Yes, gross, sorry, gross national happiness. The four pillars are promotion of sustainable development, preservation and promotion of cultural values, conservation of the natural environment, and last but not the least, the establishment of good governance. These are all extremely worthy principles uh, to which we can all subscribe. Uh, I'm reminded of the saying that uh, the environment is not what we inherit from our ancestors, but what we borrow from our successors, from the next generation. And that's, a, again, a neat way of looking at the notion of custodianship, notion of uh, uh, our obligation to preserve what we have and not simply exploit it because it's available to us. Um, Professor Brooks is the author of several books, um, one of which is uh, titled, uh, is it Social Value Creation? Mm -hmm. Social Entrepreneurship. Social Entrepreneurship. Social Entrepreneurship. And he has put forward this notion of gross national happiness uh, in another book where he says, why happiness matters for America and how we can get more of it. Now, these are extremely interesting ideas. Interesting, not the least, because happiness for many of us would really be a state of where the individual is placed. Am I content with what I have? Am I happy with uh, my situation? my context and those around me. For example, if I pick up the newspaper and I read that my old classmate Vinit Nair, we studied economics together uh, more than five decades back, that he is today a multi-millionaire. Uh, he heads uh, this, uh, this company that is kind of trying to rise from the ashes in Hyderabad. Uh, so should I be envious of Vineet and all that he has achieved? Or should I take satisfaction that here's a friend of mine who, like me, was successful in the Union Public Services exam. Uh, he joined the IAS, I joined the Foreign Service. Uh, the difference is that I stayed on in the Foreign Service. I went on to have a rewarding time and I have absolutely no regrets. But Vineet gave up his job in the IAS and joined the corporate world 
and he is today a recognized national figure. So, why should I not take satisfaction in the fact that a friend of mine has achieved so much and that uh, as an ordinary individual, I can say, look, this shows that there is a great big, big world of opportunities available to us. It's only uh, we need the vision and the drive to go and grab it. My question to Professor is, uh, I presume to put forward a question before he has even spoken, mm -hmm. uh, is how are you going to make the bridge or the connect between individual happiness and uh, national happiness? And Bhutan, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Bhutan is with us. Uh, he should be on, we are honored by your presence, sir, because your country has pioneered this notion, and a notion which has, in a sense, uh, grabbed a great deal of attention. Uh, I teach diplomacy now in my, in my second life. Uh, I teach uh, through the internet and I write books. I talk about niche diplomacy. And here is a lovely example of a small mountain kingdom that has attracted global notice by putting forward a simple seductive idea that a country, a community, a people can also think of happiness as an objective. What a beautiful idea. And uh, I would say hats off to Bhutan for having uh, presented us with a challenging notion. So my question to you, sir, will be, and I, I'm sure you will cover it, is how to take this individual uh, level, uh, individual value, into a national uh, ethos, a nat national goal. But I also hope, sir, that uh, at some point, you will tell us a little bit about the American Enterprise Institute. Because as we were talking before uh, the program began, you told me that your institute has now uh, turned its attention to India and that you have an India-focused uh, set of activities. Do please tell us a little bit about it. Uh, with these few words, uh, may I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Brooks and to invite him to speak uh, as it suits him from here or the podium. Perhaps from the podium, it will sound more magisterial. <laughs> Thank you. Delighted. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. And strengthening the entrepreneurial system in the United States and around the world. Uh, the reason that we are uh, developing our, our program in India is because it is quite simply a fact today that if you want to understand global free enterprise, you have to understand what's happening in, in India. The most important global alliance that will appear over the next two decades will be between the, the uh, largest and oldest democracies, which are both capitalist systems in the world, which is to say the alliance between the United States and India. So if we want to understand global free enterprise, we have to understand each other, and that's why we're here. Uh, I'll introduce briefly my, my colleague, Saran Andume, uh, who, who's a, a new fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Many of you know him because he's a regular columnist in the Wall Street Journal Asia. We're honored to have him here. And he's, he, uh, Saran and I have been traveling in Mumbai and Delhi for the past few days, uh, meeting people who are leaders, people who are operative in this, in this, uh, this relationship. So, um, he'll be here in, in the question and answer period, and, and if you get a chance to, to uh, get to know him a little bit better, I would encourage that. Uh, he really is our face here. You'll be seeing more events from AEI in India, in Delhi, and in Mumbai, and other places. You'll see uh, also events in Washington, D.C., featuring uh, leaders from your country and mine. Um, you know, I told you a minute ago that I have an institute, or I'm part of an institute, it started in 1938, so it's been around for a long time, dedicated to freedom, opportunity, and entrepreneurship. And I told you what we do, but I didn't tell you why we do it. And that's critically important. It's, it's easy for us in our, in our lives to be completely bound up in the questions of what. What am I doing today? And as we have all reflected on occasionally, the biggest problem that we have is we never ask why we're doing what we're doing. We don't do things with a sense of purpose. Now, an institution like the American Enterprise Institute has to have purpose every bit as much as each one of us in our individual lives. So the reason I believe that my institution exists has to be human flourishing. 
It has to be the idea of happiness. And so that's why I'm going to talk to you because of my institution, which does economic foreign and defense policy research and politics, is actually supposed to be an institution about global human flourishing. Now, I'm going to submit these ideas to your consideration, and I'm going to submit them with humility. The reason is I understand these relationships in the context of American life, and I'm learning what these mean outside of the United States. I'm learning what the relationship is between prosperity and happiness in India, and I need your help to completely bring these ideas to life. I'm looking forward to the question and answer period where you'll tell me what I say with which you disagree, and you'll help me to refine these ideas in the context of this country. So I thank you in advance for that. Um, when we talk about human happiness, there's a great deal of research going back decades. Uh, the, our, our friends from Bhutan understood this before most American researchers did, that we actually can apprehend levels of human happiness. And it's actually quite simple. We find that in the social psychology world, all you have to do is to ask people. It turns out when you have large samples of people and you ask them anonymously about their happiness, you get pretty accurate information about how happy people truly are. It sounds fantastic. It sounds like it would be a completely subjective concept, but a great deal of research has told us that in, in point of fact, you can get good information on this. Now, it's, you have to do things right. You, if you want to find out how happy a man is, you can't bring him into the same room with his wife and say, sir, how happy are you? And expect to get a, a valid answer. So the research protocols have to be pretty strict. But you can get the right information if you do experiments in, in the right way. And what you find is that relatively stable over time, you get answers that look something like this. In the United States, according to the World Values Survey, which is a very respectable nonpartisan survey of people's attitudes, you find that about 40% of Americans say that they're very happy people. 6% say they're not happy, and everybody else is somewhere in between. About half of the population is somewhat happy. Uh, in India today, 26% of the population say that they're very happy, and 26% say they're not very happy, and everybody else is in between. Now, there are reasons to be suspicious of the comparisons between countries. So there are some surveys that say that the Swedes and the Danes are the happiest people in the world. Some surveys say the Americans are the happiest. Some say that the Brazilians and Mexicans are the happiest. But in truth, when you ask these questions to different populations, they tend to answer them in different ways systematically across cultures. Uh, when, you, when you go to Brazil, for example, people will all tend to say they're very happy people for cultural reasons. My wife is from Spain, and she tells me that when you ask a Spaniard, Do you, are you very happy, they'll tend to say no because they don't want bad luck. They don't want their, you know, their happiness taken away from them. And you know, this is, these are really culturally bound things. So be suspicious, I urge you, of comparisons between countries. When I tell you that 6% of Americans are unhappy, but 26% of Indians are unhappy, that might or that might not mean something. But you can compare people inside countries. Now, as the leader of a public policy institution, my question, of course, is whether or not we can change people's happiness with good public policy, with better government, with good governance policies that, that govern the business community in particular ways, with corporate social responsibility, by trying to change and protect our culture. Can, you, we, can we actually make people happier? Because if we can, that's great. Then, then we have work to do. But maybe we can't. And the reason that we might not be able to is that you may have noticed in your own life that your moods are pretty stable. That no matter how good things are around you, you don't get permanently happier. Most of us have gotten more prosperous as we've gotten older, but most of us have not gotten dramatically happier except for the fact that things in our personal lives besides money have changed, for example. I'm a happier person today than I was when I was in my mid-20s. But it has nothing to do with the government. On the contrary, I think that the government, in trying to make life better, has made my life worse in the United States. My life is better because I have a more stable family life, because I have a better career, and a number of other things. Now, psychologists have noticed this fact. Psychologists have noticed that people tend to be stable inside their personalities, and that outside influences don't matter very much. And there's a wonderful set of research that looks at identical twins. 
Now, identical twins are carbon copies of each other genetically, but there's one source of data that takes identical twins and they were separated at birth to different families. They've gotten them back together at age 40 and they've looked at their personalities to say how much of their happiness is genetic and how much of their happiness is from their environment. And what they find is that 80% of their happiness is genetic. Incredible. So eight tenths of all of your happiness comes from your family. So if, if you believe that your mother made you unhappy, you're right, actually. But physically, you're correct that that's actually what's happening. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't care about the other 20%? And the answer to that is no. That actually means we need to make sure that all of our decisions and all of our policies are right because the stakes are higher for the 20% that, that is at our disposal. Just as if you found out that you have five years to live, only five years to live instead of 30 years to live, of course you'd make different and better decisions about your remaining five years of life. Such is the same also with the fact that you have 20% of your own happiness to work with. Make sure that you get things right. So my question is, what actually makes people happy? The, the first thing I did when I was doing research on this subject is I went and I asked people. It's sort of a lost art in social science is to talk to human beings. And I went out and talked to a lot of people and said, what, what would make you a happier person than today? I just, once again, I was only talking to Americans in this study, uh, except for the Spaniard that I live with at home. And I said, what would make you a happier person? And a remarkable number of people told me something about money. They said, well, if I would, you know, my economic circumstances would improve, if I would hit the lottery, if I would get a raise, I know that would make me happy. This is paradoxical, because you know in your hearts that money doesn't buy happiness. We all know that. We learned that from our mothers, and we learned that from our houses of worship. I mean, everybody knows this morally, but we act as if money made us a lot happier. People do terrible things for money. They neglect their families. They fight each other for inheritances. Sometimes they do illegal or dishonest things that they know they shouldn't do for money. So does money buy happiness, or doesn't it? That's a research question, and economists have been looking at that for decades. So what do they find? Now, the first way that economists look at this question is to compare rich and poor countries. And I've already cautioned you against understanding whether or not you can, you can look at two countries and say which is happier. But economists, nonetheless, have asked, are richer countries happier than poorer countries? And the answer is sort of. When countries uh, are below the level of subsistence, which is to say when people are dying of starvation and are preventable diseases, money can make people happier. We know that it will relieve people against things that no matter where they are in the population, these are bad things for happiness. Having a child die is bad for rich people, it's bad for middle class people, and it's bad for poor people. And if we can relieve the conditions of basic human suffering, even with money, people will get happier. But when we get to the level of subsistence, money doesn't buy happiness anymore comparing countries. So for example, we find that the French are twice as likely as the Mex or three times as rich as the Mexicans on average, but both countries are above the level of subsistence on average. You find that the Mexicans are twice as happy as the French. Now, why is that? It has to do with Mexican culture and French culture, Mexican traditions and French traditions. Mexican life and French socialism. There are things that match together that don't lead to happy Frenchmen and do lead to happy Mexicans. And it has nothing to do with the fact that the French have more money than the Mexicans. Okay, so what we find is in a nutshell that more money is great until you get above poverty and then it's not so great anymore. The United States, according to this, will not get happier if we get richer. Now, I don't want to find this. I'm a capitalist. I'm a free enterprise microeconomist by training. I want to find that money will make me happy. I want to find that money will make you happy. But it's not true, according to these data, and I have to confront that. OK, now the second way that we look in the research at whether or not money buys happiness is to look at one country across time instead of comparing countries. So we have lots of data on the United States. 
In 1972, uh, about 31% of Americans, according to one survey, about 31% of Americans said they were completely happy. Now, in 2004, the average American had 50% more income in purchasing power, and that actually was true across all sections of the income distribution. Poor people were richer, middle class people were richer, and the rich were a lot richer in the United States. And what percentage of Americans were completely happy? 31%. It hadn't changed at all. So what you find is that Americans are the same level of happiness as they've always been, but they've gotten richer and richer and richer. Okay, now, that's sort of strike two for the money buys happiness hypothesis. Strike three comes when we look at what happens to individuals as they get happier. Once again, in the United States, when people are poor and they move into the middle class, you see slight increases in their happiness. But above the lower middle class, people don't get happier at all. We find that when people move out of the lower middle class into the upper middle class, into the upper classes, they simply don't get happier over the course of their lives that you can connect with their money. Now, you find that people think they should be happier. They feel that they probably are happier until they actually assess their happiness. Then they say, actually, not so much, which is an interesting paradox. People feel that they should be happier, but they're not. And actually, there's a kind of a guilt that comes because people actually don't find themselves to be happier even though they've gotten richer. Now, why is this? And there's a lot of research that goes into as people get richer, how come their life is not improving? And this is a, this is a phenomenon that, that economists call the hedonic treadmill, which is kind of a depressing metaphor. You're on a treadmill, and no matter what happens, you stay in the same place. So when people get a little richer, for six months they get happier, and then they go back to where they were, it turns out. Now, we have lots of data on this. We haven't even have data from people who win the lottery. And I'm going to come back to that here in a second. But suffice it to say that if I were to ask you what would happen if you hit the national lottery, none of you would say something terrible. You'd all say something good would happen to your life if you hit the lottery. That's why people buy lottery tickets. It's not so their life will be ruined or not so they'll be neutral, but rather so good things will happen to them. And there's a party game in America where people who don't know each other will get to know each other by each one answering the question, if you hit the lottery, what would you do? It gives a window onto the soul. So what would you do if you hit the lottery? Some people will say, I would quit my job and I would go do something I love like writing poetry. Some people would say, I would leave Washington, D.C. and I would move to Florida because I was like sunshine. Uh, when men are trying to impress women, they say, I would start a foundation, right? Um, <laughs> it's not true, incidentally, but uh, it's, and everybody says something good. Nobody says something bad. Well, I'm going to talk to you here in a second about what would really happen because I have data on lottery winners. I know what happens to their life after they win the lottery, and, and I'll give you a hint. It's not good. It's not a good thing. So what we find is that no matter how you look at it, when people get richer on average, if they're getting happier, it's not because of the money. If they're above the level of subsistence, particularly if they're above the level of middle class, this is not what's going to make their lives happy. And the conclusion is money doesn't buy happiness, just as we've always heard. Now, there's a real paradox, which is why do we keep acting as if money bought happiness? Why do we stay on the hedonic treadmill? And there are answers to this. Uh, you know, and and it is, there's a very interesting literature that psychologists have undertaken that asks, what's the unhappiest average age in a man's life? And there's an identifiable unhappiest age in a man's life. Um, and this is based on data on Americans and Europeans. There's, n it's not data, there's no Asian data. So again, you'll have to decide whether or not this is true here. But what age do you think it is, the average unhappiest age in a man's life? So, Don, on. What, what age do you think it is, the unhappiest age in a man's life? Uh, 85. Ah. Okay, so we've got to 18 and 85. So, I'll give you a hint. It's in the middle of 18. It's, uh, and the answer is 44. 44 is the average unhappiest age in a man's life <clears throat> in America, in Europe. So, how come? Psychologists have a basic non-economic answer, and it, and it has to do with the quality of marriage. And 
basically, and, and in a nutshell, I'm not a psychologist, so I'll just give you the, the bottom line, which is that age 44 <laughs> is when your wife has definitively figured out that you're boring, right? <clears throat> But uh, 44 is also when you're most likely to have adolescent children in the home, which is a nightmare in all cultures, I realize. So, but that's not the economic explanation. Economists have a better explanation for the, for the midlife crisis at age 44. It's not hormonal, it's economic. And it basically goes something like this. We are looking for the value that we can create in life. Now, how do you measure the value you're creating in life? I'm going to talk about it more in a second because we do have ways to measure it, and I'm going to tell you what our research has found. But in general, we're all trying to create value in our lives. How do you measure it? The answer is indirectly. You measure it in terms of how the market rewards you, typically, for the value that you create. And one handy, convenient way to do that is with money. We say, how well am I doing? How much value am I creating for myself and for others? It depends on how much money I'm bringing home from my job. And so we get very used to, in our 20s, following the amount of money that we make. People chase money for the reason that they crave the creation of value. We are created as people to make value in our lives and the lives of other people. This is what we're driven, this is what we're wired, what we're programmed to do. Those of you who have strong religious beliefs will join me in believing that this is divine that the creation of value is a divine concept. The trouble is, measuring it is, is next to impossible with our earthly means. And so we look at how much money we have, and we get used to doing that. Now here's the problem. By age 44, the paths have diverged between the value you're creating and the money you're bringing home. And so men at age 44, in the West at least, they say, I'm not following my heart. I'm not following my passion at all. I don't like being a lawyer, or I don't like running this company. I want to be a college professor, or I want to be a carpenter, or I want to do something else, but I can't because I have handcuffs on. I have my children in private schools, and I have the mortgage on my house, and I'm stuck. And men say, I'm stuck because of money, and this creates a crisis. There's an economic explanation that has to do with the tyranny of measuring the wrong thing. People who measure their own self-worth in money end up depressed. So it's, and, and that's an empirical fact, that's not a theological fact. And the reason has to do with simply what social scientists call construct validity problems. It also just means you're measuring the wrong thing, is what it boils down to. OK, so if money doesn't matter, what matters? And we know the answer to this. In a nutshell, three things matter to make people happier. Meaning, control, and earned success. Those are the three elixirs of human happiness. What's meaning? Meaning is the focus of why you exist. Institutions of meaning basically are fourfold. Faith, family, community, and vocation. Those are the four things that, from pe which people derive their meaning, and meaning is one of the sources from which they derive their happiness. The two biggest are faith and family. So, and, and once again, I'm basing this on study of the, studies of Americans, so I submit this to you with appropriate humility. People who, are, uh, who regularly practice their faith are twice as happy as people who don't. People who spend a lot of time, according to their own admission, developing their spiritual lives are twice as happy as people who don't. And it doesn't depend on religion. It turns out that people who are practicing Catholics or practicing Muslims, who are practicing Protestants or Jews or Hindus, who take it seriously, have equal or indistinguishably high levels of happiness. And people who don't practice faith are far less happy. This is a source of general meaning in people's lives. Now, I'm not telling you what's right. I'm simply telling you what the data say about what makes people happy. Fact number two, family life makes people happy, particularly marriage. Married people are the happiest people. You'll find, for example, that if 40% of the population says that they're very happy, at least half of that can be tracked to family life particularly marriage. Now, unhappy marriage is a source of misery, but that's a minority of, tr truly a minority of marriages. <clears throat> what you find is that people who are married are happier, and that's especially true for men. Women and men differ in lots of ways. Uh, marital status is an interesting one. 
Uh, single women are happier than single men. Married women are happier than married women, although marriage per se makes men happier. Widowed women are much happier than widowed men. I told that to my wife. She said, hmm. Um, the only group of men who are happier than women are divorced men. Divorced men are happier than divorced women. Now, why? And the answer is simple. Because generally speaking, when men and women divorce, women get the children. And that actually makes divorced women a lot less happy because their lives are unduly complicated. They have to work and they have to take care of kids. And that's an extremely complicated situation. At least it is in the West, in, in the United States, where we get these data from. Children are extremely complicated in the happiness calculus. The happiest people have children, but children per se don't make people happier. I, I realize that's paradoxical. Happy people have kids, although kids actually attenuate the short-term happiness of people, but give meaning to their lives in the long run. I recommend having children, but I don't promise people they're going to be happier the minute they have them, is basically what it boils down to. So num institution number one is meaning. And I'm going to come back to how we actually turn that into public policy, or we should think about that in terms of public policy. Number two ingredient for human happiness is control. People who feel they have control in their lives and over their lives are the happiest people. Control comes in three areas, political, economic, and social. You can think of this as political freedom, economic freedom, and social freedom. The more political freedom people have, the happier they are. The more economic freedom people have, the happier they are. These are iron laws based on both European and American data. Right? These are, there, there is no variation to this. We have studies from Switzerland, we have studies from Norway, we have studies from Canada, from the United States, from Mexico. And political control and freedom is better than less, more is better than less, and it's also true in the economic world. When people feel that they're in the control, they are happier, much happier. Social control is more complicated. When people feel that they have the ability to do what they want socially, when they even have the ability to do bad things socially, they're happier, but only if they choose not to do them. Now, this is interesting. This is a very, so in other words, what you find is that happier societies don't legally prohibit conjugal infidelity, but they, they, don't, they don't engage in conjugal infidelity. What we need, societies that are happiest are ones where things are legal that are bad, but there's lots of social stigma. Those are the happiest societies where people choose to behave morally and impose moral standards on each other informally, but not legally. So these are, the, the, and I realize that's complicated, but I, I suspect that you apprehend it. So control is incredibly important. Here's the last ingredient, earned success. A very interesting phenomenon is that when you look in any particular community, you'll find that people who are richer look like they're happier than people who are poorer. Now, the conclusion from that, from a lot of left-wing economists, is that, is that income inequality matters, per se, to happiness. That in a community, it's bad to have income inequality because it leads the people who have less to be unhappy, the people who have more to be happy, and for people to strive simply to get more than their neighbors, which leads to environmental degradation and excessive work and a lot of things that actually aren't good for our society and aren't good for our economy or, or, or in our environment. Now, that's convenient, and that's a very common belief in the West, and, and I know here, too, that inequality, economic inequality is a bad thing per se, and it's actually good to bring the top down as a result of that. That's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is it actually looks at the wrong data. What truly makes people happy is not having more than their neighbors, it's earning their success. Earned success is the belief that you have created value in your life or the life of somebody else. And when you ask people, do you believe you have earned your success, people who say yes are dramatically happier than people who say no. Now, it is also true that people who earn their success tend to earn more money. But it is the earned success and not the money, and this is a statistical fact, not just a belief, people who earn their success are happier not because of the money, but because of the earned success per se. Now, this is an important fact. Governments are very good at spreading money around. They're terrible at spreading earned success around. Earned success is in here, and it comes at best from outside from entrepreneurs. 
earn success doesn't come from governments. And so the, the problem is, when the government spreads money around in redistribution, it doesn't spread any happiness around. And this leads to a paradox in the United States. Politicians promise greater happiness when they offer redistribution policies. Citizens always hate those policies. Why? Because the government is promising something it can't deliver on. It's, it's not the politician's fault. Politicians believe that they actually can achieve greater success, but they can't with redistribution unless they're mitigating starvation and preventable diseases. If they're doing anything else to bring the top down, they will not make people happier. On the contrary, they will create greater misery. The policy imperative is more earned success, and that means more entrepreneurship, more private initiative, more private enterprise, better education, and better public health. Those are the ways that governments can help people or, or relieve the conditions under which people can't earn their success. That's what we should be focusing on in public policy. Now, what is the system? And now I'm talking from a very American perspective at this point. So once again, I look forward to your perspectives on this. What is the system in which most people can earn their success? The answer is free enterprise. It's where labor markets match people's skills to their passions, where people have mobility, where people are not held down by social class. It's one that rewards merit. It's one that penalizes free riding and corruption and laziness and stupidity. stupidity. It's the system that is most likely to be a meritocracy and therefore which yields the most earned success and therefore which leads us to the greatest happiness. The bottom line is for meaning, invocation, for, for, for control, economic freedom, and especially earned success, the free enterprise system, which is the system for which my institution stands, is the happiest system for most Americans, which is the reason that we find most Americans find that free enterprise is a cultural institution, not an economic one. And my own personal belief is that free enterprise is not an economic alternative, it's a moral imperative. Because it is our duty to allow people to pursue their happiness. That is in the Declaration of Independence of my country, that we are endowed by our creator unalienably with the rights of freedom, uh, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's right there in our founding documents. How do we do it? Worked out from day to day. And the answer is the free enterprise that's st staring us right in the face. So the bottom line is, if we want better public policy and we want better culture, we need to focus on the institutions that bring us three things. Meaning, control, and earn success. This has changed my beliefs as an economist. This has changed my beliefs as an executive. And it's changed my beliefs as a father, quite frankly. I have three children, 7, 10, and 12. What, do I, what am I trying to do for my kids? Am I trying to find their path and tell them what to do? No. I want them to enjoy the meaning that I enjoy through faith, family, community, and vocation. I want them to have control and freedom to make the right decisions and to live in a system that's economically free, that's politically free, and that's socially free, but in which they have the morality and the values and the principles to make the right decision and to prohibit themselves from doing things that are, that are, that are, that are destructive. And that means traditional cultural values. And third, I want a system of earned success. I demand a system of earned success for me and for my children and grandchildren. And that gives me a guide to parenting, to community life, and to public policy that leads my country to be as happy as it can possibly be, which is the moral imperative, I think, of, of, of my life. Thank you. Catholic Church, that when young women uh, say that they wish to join uh, the order of nuns, they write a kind of narrative of their lives and how they see the world around them. And somebody did research on the basis of a whole collection of these narratives written in the 20s and 30s. And um, uh, then went on to see what happened to the people, uh, these nuns. Uh, where did they end up, how long did they live, etc. And the researcher who categorized these narratives into those that had an optimistic outlook of life and those 
that seemed weighed down by issues and problems and saw the world more in terms of difficulties, that those with an optimistic outlook uh, ended up living significantly longer than the other group. Now, this is just one piece of uh, evidence. We may or may not take it for granted uh, or believe in it, because the other day I read in the newspaper, and of course, you know, we have to believe everything we read in the newspapers, that's why a chap like me is totally confused, uh, uh, said that those who are grumpy live longer than those who claim they are happy. So here is a challenge for you, sir. I mean, there are guys who really believe that grumpiness is the path to uh, doing well in life. But one can be grumpy in a happy way and grumpy in a miserable way. I suppose one can go into that. But I don't want to go on much longer. Uh, the lady right out there and then you, sir, and then you. We'll take the first, we'll take three, four uh, comments and questions. Uh, uh, no, in a, in a cluster and then go on to the next one. Yes, please. It was a good, interesting uh, presentation. I was just wondering if you would like to compare the American survey with the Chinese survey, which is much talked about now, where they say that it's 45% Chinese who feel they are happy and 11% feel who are unhappy. And the latest economist says that they are not much concerned with economic growth, but they are pursuing happiness in matters of quality of life issues. So. Would you like to comment on that? And what you have said actually makes it all very complex. Nothing could be fixed as one thing which matters. They are a combination of things which matter. And would you then define them in terms of quality of life issues? Very interesting. It was a very interesting talk, of course. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, have you looked into, in, in the same culture and country, with the effect of climate uh, that you live in? And the other is, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the joint family system, particularly in India and in some other Asian countries at least. What is the impact, if any, and uh, on, on uh, gross or net happiness? Thank you. Uh, I have a question around, is being happy a coachable skill and therefore a learnable skill? Uh, I would like to quote from my own uh, experience in life. I, I belong to a very uh, ordinary middle class family and when I was growing up in 50s and 60s, I had a firm belief that being unhappy is bad or being happy is bad because there is so much of misery around and in my household, in my house, if there was a laughter, we were afraid that our father is going to feel bad about it and we'll get scolded for it. Because if there was laughter, he says, no, no, you're not studying, you should be studying, why are you wasting your time? And that's the kind of belief I carried with me till about 10 to 12 years back when I met a person whom I call my guru and mentor and he taught me being happy is the fundamental right. And in a way, he changed my whole outlook towards life. And now, I've, I'm a totally opposite person. And whenever I feel unhappy or miser miserly, I straight away say, no, no, I need to be happy. And I like to be surrounded by happy people. And that's, that's a total change which has come up. So I just want to ask, is being happy a coachable skill? Uh, in, in, in the French labor market, if you leave your job at the post office, you'll probably be on, the government, on government support for the rest of your career, and you'll be less happy. And that means you're stuck, potentially, in a job you like less. Now, that means that the boundaries of happiness are much closer in. What does that mean in China? 
I, I don't know, actually. People should be talking about their quality of life issues, but when people don't feel like there are enough issues, enough ways to expand economically their, their boundaries of freedom, they're going to turn to ways that they can be happy outside of the economic system. So once again, I'm very dubious of, of these comparisons. Almost always, when you see international comparisons of happiness, there's an agenda. And the agenda is to show that America is less happy than centrally planned economies. Look at every single one of these studies, the Leicester study in England, uh, the studies that actually look at developing economies versus the United States, you will find, inevitably, that, that non-capitalist economies, see, are less happy than capitalist economies. And that's actually the agenda. Now, the, it's troubling. I mean, it's perfectly possible that people could differ across cultures, but we just don't know. Uh, on this, and so I'm, I'm agnostic on that. I wish I could give you a better answer, but that's that's that, that's my immediate reaction to it. Climate. Um, there's there's conflicting data on whether climate matters. We do know for sure that when you move to a better climate, you will be happier for at least six months. That's one thing that we find. So, but there's also evidence that you will get used to it by about six months. And so what that says is you should live in a terrible climate for six months a year and a nice climate for six months a year and always be changing because on, on average you'll be able to get the, you won't get used to it too terribly much. And that's actually the wisdom that people who move south in the winter have kind of figured out on their own. Now, that said, if you want to hedge your bets, live in a nice place. You know for sure it's not going to make you happy living in a place where it rains all the time. I'm from a city called Seattle where it rains constantly. And it actually has the highest suicide rate in the United States. I think that the correlation uh, the, is pretty obvious. Seattle is a city. It is a lovely city. It is, I'm, I'm glad that, that many people live there, um, and not including me. So <clears throat> the joint families. Uh, once again, the, 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 the institutions of meaning are faith, family, vocation, and community. And essentially what this does, what joint families do, is it conflates community and family. Community and family takes on a different, and these are both, there are lots and lots of ways to create institutions of meaning. And the nuclear family versus the joint family, there's no evidence that one is better than the other. It, it depends a lot on culture. I can tell you personally that if I lived with my mother-in-law, I would be less happy. But in, in, uh, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a matter of basic principle, there's no evidence that says that, that one system is better than the other. Is happiness coachable? Completely coachable. Now, once again, depending on the study, there's only between 20 and 50% that we really can affect. But coaching people can affect that 20 to 50% in a, in a very, very big way. So what do we do to get that? Well, Albert Camus. Uh, once said that happiness is like a butterfly. If you try to catch it, you won't. But if you sit quietly, it might sit on your shoulder, come sit on your shoulder. Evidence shows that people who spend their lives trying explicitly to be happy don't achieve it. What you need to do is to, is to, is to put your priorities on the institutions that you know lead to happiness, meaning, control, and earn success. How do you get meaning, control, and earn success? All the things that I've talked about, faith, family, communities, and vocation. Uh, exercising your own freedom and working for the freedom of other people. In a nutshell, there are two moral ways to exercise the institutions of meaning, earn success, and control. They are self-actualization and service to others. Those are the two things, basically if you remember two things that we talked about today, dedicate yourselves to self-actualization and service to others. Of course, those two things are related. People who dedicate themselves to service to others inevitably find a certain amount of self-actualization. But if what we're doing in our entrepreneurial lives, our faith lives, and the way that we create a better world for our communities and our families and our nation, if, if that's a self-actualizing thing to, to, to pursue skills and passions and dreams, and at the same time work for the good of our fellow man, these basically are the moral oracle that will lead to the institutions of happiness and will lead to happiness itself. And that's as and that's actually a source of real coaching, I think, that we can give to ourselves. You know, Professor, it's interesting that the very last part of the answer you gave is so much akin to the core of the philosophy of Vedanta, uh, which is that you really search for your own self-improvement or realization, as you called it, and the notion of service to others. I mean, it's, it's amazing how uh, great ideas 
really have a universality. But I don't want to go on further. Uh, Let yes. Me make one comment about, one, a comment about capitalism, if I might, that relates to this. We think of capitalism as something that's empty and materialistic. And in point of fact, when capitalism is pursued for materialistic ends, it will lead to unhappiness. But capitalism, in, in terms of free enterprise, really is a wonderful way for people to satisfy the dual goals of self-actualization and service to others. And when we pursue free enterprise explicitly, not for money per se, but for self-actualization and creativity and service to other people to give them jobs and growth and opportunity, then the free enterprise system truly is a vehicle for great good and a vehicle for great happiness. That's, that, as far as I'm concerned, is the deep magic of an institute like the American Enterprise Institute, that we can, that we can serve our country and the world. I admire the way you weave in your company message into your responses, sir. Uh, yes, first here, then any others, over here, and the lady here. And there, four. We'll take four now. Uh, professor, I come to this from a very different point of view. I help companies create value. And one of the things that we are finding is and, and we also measure value. And one of the things that we uh, realize now is values create value. So companies that have a value system tend to create value. This, I'm going to be a little long because I, to get the answer from him. Uh, yeah. So, so, so what, what, what happens is that people are now finding that there are what we call firms of endearment. Companies that try to create happiness within their stakeholders, companies that are caring about their stakeholders, tend to make more or create more value for their shareholders. Okay, so I, we, we're saying that creating value for the shareholders is the more important thing, but to do that, you have to create happiness for the stakeholders, which means for the employees, for the customers, and for your partners, right? And why the employee is so important, because taking from what you've said, is that 50% of, of, of your waking life is spent at work. And therefore, if you can do something at work, you can improve this. So we have something called corporate actualization. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my whole thing, uh, my whole question basically is how, how can we really make, uh, use this to create more happiness for the society? Good. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was here, the gentleman here. Yeah, I come to you. Uh, hi, I'm Sandeep. Uh, nice talk and uh, I think a lot of food for thought. So I wouldn't say I have some questions, or maybe I'll have some more food for thought in a reverse sense. Uh, quick three things. Uh, you're talking a lot about bachelorhood and married people, or a lot of uh, contrasting examples. Uh, I have figured out uh, an intuitive scale that, say, minus 10 is very unhappy and 10 is very happy. Then bachelorhood oscillates between minus 6 and plus 6 and married people oscillate between minus 9 and plus 9. <laughs> so, <laughs> whatever worth it is. Good. So the highs are there and the lows are there. Uh, second perspective is when I was in 8th grade, I laid my hands on a book by J. Krishnamurti. Uh, I found it very difficult to understand what it was. But the essence was that everyone wants to be happy. And when are you most happy? When you are being creative. And in trying to be creative, you have to let go the security of the known and you have to venture into the unknown. However, man is so insecure that he clings to the known and so the seed of unhappiness comes in. Elaborations could be there. The third quick one is, uh, can we measure happiness? If we measure happiness, can there be levels like you have in atoms, shells like K, L, M, and so on? So do we talk of uh, ecstasy or orgasmic happiness or some unhappiness? Uh, for last five years, we have been doing competitiveness studies of cities of India and industries. So we do some kind of measurement using about 
700 economic and social indicators is purely objective. But still I feel that can we measure an abstract principle like this? Uh, because when we are happy, I think, uh, the words fail us. So can it be expressed or captured in words? Maybe, maybe silence is what it is. Thank you. Um, uh, said regarding your speech, you know, you ended up with three factors which are essentially vital for happiness, like meaning, control. Uh, but at the end, I thought the entire emphasis became on free enterprise. All right? uh, so you haven't dwelt on the first two. Uh, and uh, secondly, you know, even on free enterprise, as you said, if people are allowed to do what they want to do, uh, even commercial activities, then that will lead to happiness. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it is the environment within which they are working that is important. And therein the concept of good governance comes. If good governance can be guaranteed by the government, okay, and of course we are all for democracy and I'm totally for democracy, but I'm saying that if good governance can come through communist system also, uh, you know, it's okay. Uh, it, because essentially I want good law and order. Uh, if, if um, you know, a, a government can give me good law and order situation, uh, that will help me to do what I want to do Eas mo more easily than if the law and order situation was not good enough. So I would just like your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Brooks, I am Jacob Mapalashiri. I have a suggestion, in fact, not a question. Without trying to detract from what you were saying, uh, you must be aware of the king of Bhutan measuring the economic pro prosperity of his country in terms of happiness. There was a survey by UN some years back which said Bangladeshis are the happiest people on earth. They are the poorest people on earth rather. And India, I suppose Indians scored seven and developed countries like USA were way down 35 and even b below that. Now the point I'm trying to make is these ideas come into actual discourse and get the recognition and respect they deserve only when academicians like you and institutions that you represent take it up, develop it, and propound it. Actually, there is a, a, a lacuna or a lack somewhere. We need not have, we need not have had to have, oh, I, I'm complicating it, we would not have needed 9-11 to tell us about the dangers of extremism and you know, all that stuff. We need not have, we, we, we would not have needed to have a global financial and even economic crisis to tell us about the excesses, dangers that were prevalent in the Wall Street. I am not saying capitalism, but the practices followed by the banks there. Now, people like you are taking up this idea. The West leads the world in new ideas in governance, economics, social development. But frankly, if I'm allowed to say so, what you, what you possess in intelligence, you lack in wisdom. I suggest you should listen to the wisdom of the East in formulated policies, which apparently you wish will be of help to the whole world. Thank you. There are a lot, of, a lot of food for thought, obviously, that we've heard in the last four. And, and I'll, I'll just take up a couple of elements of each one. Um, can values create value? Absolutely. I mean, and this is something that, that great companies have always found, that values can create value. Um, is, how should, what, what should be the basic orientation toward those uh, that we serve? And the answer, of course, is service. You find that companies... Uh, that try to inculcate a culture of love toward their employees, of love toward their clients, of love toward their competitors, and of love toward their society, um, they create more value. And they create more value not just because they're creating more profit, but because their people are more fulfilled and happier. And ultimately, this is what we're trying to do. We, we, we want an economy not just so that it will print more dollars, we want an economy that will help us to facilitate better lives. Uh, when people are motivated by selfishness to create wealth, 
they find emptiness. And when people are motivated by uh, self-actualization and service to others, they find great meaning. And, and this is the reason of this. So to the extent that you're helping people to create value through values, the value that you're creating may be monetized, may be measured in the bottom line, but you're doing so much more than that, then congratulations. Now, what about what's known or unknown? What about risk? How do we understand people who will choose a known risk-free environment that makes them unhappy as opposed to delving into the, delving into the unknown? Well, this is the difference between entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs, in point of fact. Um, all entrepreneurs have three things in common. Number one, they put capital at risk. And I don't mean money. Social capital, linguistic capital, cultural capital, religious capital. The most single entrepreneurial act is immigration. This is the reason that Americans are so entrepreneurial. I mean, in point of fact, Americans are very entrepreneurial. Why? Because we're all immigrants. Because either us or our ancestors actually put all of their capital at risk and engaged in the ultimate entrepreneurial experience. They were risk takers. The second characteristic of entrepreneurs is that they use resources or they count on resources they don't currently have in hand. And the third is they're in, in search of explosive rewards. What is a governance system that works best? Governance is hugely important. Why? What is the government supposed to do? Now this is my view. The government is supposed to do two things. The government is supposed to think about a minimum basic standard for people in a civilized society. I don't think we should be stepping over starving children in America. And so I think that a minimum basic standard of living is quite important for government. Number two is to solve cases where markets fail. And markets fail all the time. They fail in cases of pollution. They fail in cases where public wants something that they have no individual uh, emphasis to provide, like the army or police services. They, there are monopolies. There are cases in which people prey on each other because one side has more information than another. Those are the cases for which the government actually exists. And if we don't have good governance, we won't solve those market failures, and capitalism and free enterprise will not function. The government has to exist for us to have free enterprise, in point of fact. Now, I realize that that's not very controversial. It can be among free enterprise people, but in point of fact, it's true. So what's the best system? There is no empirical evidence that a system that doesn't reward merit will ever provide the, 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 the governance that will allow people to take risks. And that's the reason that free enterprise simply works better than a system of socialism or communism. Socialism and communism don't work well above the level of the family. I mean, I, socialism is great at the level of the family. We're socialists in my household. Um, I don't tell my children that they're really unproductive and so they should get less food. They're horribly unproductive people because they're 7 and 10 and 12 years old. And, and so I practice socialism. But I know that the higher the level, the more the incentives of people are misaligned by this system. And we can't achieve the governance goals very well of the minimum basic standard and solving market failures. What we get at is a system that doesn't reward merit very well. And that's empirically problematical. So while in theory, academicians tend to say any system can work, in practice, uh, the systems of collectivism don't very well. And that leads to, that leads to un, in my view, and I, and I say this with real humility, and, and, I, and I appreciate and welcome your disagreement, that leads uh, the least among us to suffer unduly sometimes for decades. And that, in my view, is an unpardonable sin. Now, the last point is uh, whether or not uh, I could use more wisdom as opposed to simply intellectual, the intellectual basis for what I say. And I've, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely true. And the, my, the search of my life is for greater wisdom. Thank you. And, and I'll take all wisdom, Eastern and Western. Thank you. <laughs> that means no, putting no condition on happiness. Say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Starting with happiness. Right. Feeling that you are happy. Right. Without any conditions. Without any what? Any Without conditions. any conditions. That right. you, such a such thing will happen, then only I'll be, I'll be happy. Right. Oh, oh yeah, sure. I mean, this is actually... You start with happiness and, 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 and do everything in happiness. Sure, and, absolutely. Is it possible? Um, to, to be, well, theoretically, of course, we can... And, and this gets to something else that, 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 that you said, which is... Um, Happiness actually comes not from some active, something active or from words, but rather from silence, from quietness and from emptiness in which we can 
theoretically attain a state of bliss. And in which case, you could asymptotically into a state of continuous happiness. I don't know anybody who's attained that. But of course, that is ultimately the teaching of most religions, is to attain a state of bliss by being in complete harmony with one's values and, and, and essentially be in a state of silence, in a state of, of real quietness. I mean, this is the central message I mean, that, that of my religion, for example. Um, I haven't attained it. Uh, most people haven't, and, and what I want are those conditions that are the best that we can to help people to facilitate their own quest for that, I think. You know, there is one thing I failed to do this morning, which is to give you the corporate message of the Aspen Institute. My good friend Basu over there will put a black mark against me if I don't tell you, exactly as the gentleman who is uh, helping companies to realize themselves in a fashion, uh, that the Aspen Institute is all about values. It's all about leadership that is driven by values. And uh, there is lots of material on the Aspen Institute that's available. It's on the internet. You can check it out. And there are brochures and other material that's available here. But here is a bunch of people who are driven by the notion that uh, our own legacy, our own heritage, gives us a great deal of wisdom, eastern, western, northern, southern, whatever, which can be mined, which can be utilized in order to extract from it values that are universal. Before we do the last round, uh, I do realize, I do feel that, given the presence of His Excellency, the Ambassador of Bhutan, that we should give him a chance to say something if he wishes. I'm not putting you on the spot, sir. You don't have to say something. But given that Bhutan is the originator of this uh, notion of happiness as a measure, not just for individuals, but for countries, would you like to say a few words, sir? Uh, microphone, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I congratulate uh, Dr. Brooks for a very uh, uh, stimulating uh, talk. Happiness is a very broad subject, and it's very difficult to uh, uh, completely capture the meaning of happiness in just a short session. As far as uh, Bhutan is concerned, uh, we never really went out of the way to uh, promote happiness. It was our king, the fourth king of Bhutan, Jimmy Singhi Wangchuk, who in the early part of his reign in the 1970s, he was looking for a way to develop our country and to uh, see what would be best for the people of Bhutan. We were a least developed country. We had just opened up into uh, the uh, uh, world, starting our five-year plans only in 1961. He took over as king in 1972. And he said that, uh, well, when we develop, we must make sure that the overall objective should always be that the citizens are content and that they feel a sense of fulfillment uh, in their life. So the development philosophy was basically economic development is very important. We have to have economic development. Without economic development, we cannot have uh, contentment of the people. But let us not get carried away only with economic development. We also have to uh, take the responsibility we have a pristine environment. We have a rich tradition and culture. We have good social values. All of this must be preserved because they also contribute to the quality of life. Basically, give the people a good quality of life. And quality of life in, uh, in, uh, uh, is very important to have economic development. But at the same time, you must have a sense of satisfaction from social bonds, from community bonds, from family values, family relations. And this is where somebody mentioned about the joint family system. We have a joint family system in Bhutan also. With development, nuclear families are also coming in. But at the same time, we are trying to uh, preserve the network of the joint family system, maybe not so much as in the past, but it comes in very, very useful as people grow older. We do not want old homes to come up in Bhutan. We want the families to have this support system for each other. At the same time, we want the uh, 
income to rise. <coughs> GDP is very important. Our king said that GNH is gross national happiness is as important as GDP. He never said that it's more important than GDP. Let us keep a balance. So this is reflected from our Buddhist uh, culture. Lord Buddha says, take the middle path. We are trying to take the middle path. In a nutshell, I could go on and on, but in a nutshell, that's what we are trying to do. Spiritual, cultural, environmental, uh, economical. All in harmony and in balance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amar. Thank you, Ambassador, for giving us such a brilliant, precise uh, concept of what Bhutan is all about. Uh, a last round of questions, please. Uh, over here, uh, here, and there, and there. Four, uh, five. All right, sir. Here, then here, please. I have listened to all who have spoken. I think the essence of it all was presented by His Excellency just now to be in harmony. I think, Professor, you also in brief mentioned something about happiness coming from within. If you are not in balance with yourself or the environment, I believe you cannot be happy. And it should be the policies of governments as that of Bhutan to promote such an environment. Uh, very nice points came out of your talk and also the observations of the Excellency. My feeling is that all these, uh, I'll take only two people, the politicians and the bureaucrats. The politicians are stuck to power and the other, the bureaucrats making, some of them making money and all this thing. It must be giving them some happiness. That is why they are doing all this thing. So my point is, can your institute with your long experience, decondition their mind that, <laughs> that these things will not give you happiness, but the other things will happiness. You will create a revolution in the world. Just your thoughts. I'm, I'm caught in a uh, sort of confusion. I, agree with what you say. There should be openness, open societies, and so on. And at the same time, as an Indian, uh, I cannot avoid the fact that in my country we have so many poor people. We see so much misery. So the question really is, in a society like ours, and I cannot speak about the rest of the world, how do we synthesize an open system which I'm all for, and which we, I think, among all countries in the world, no country in the world has tried to find this synthesis for as many people uh, as sustained in the post-war period as India has. I don't think China has done it. I don't think any other country has done it. We're an open system. And yet, uh, we are still going through a very troubled place uh, situation, and I think His Excellency the Ambassador uh, brought us back to heal. He, 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 he told us verities which I, as an Indian, fully embrace, because I think it also exists in our society. I mean, I do not see his culture and mine as being different. And as a consequence, I would like to ask you, how would you go about suggesting a process of synthesizing all that is good in the open liberal system, which is a political issue, and how does a country like ours, which is trying to, do, to create that, and we talk about something called inclusive growth. I mean, this is the way in which we try and, and try and implement what we think would meet the needs of openness in terms of development and inclusiveness in terms of the poorest of whom there are 400 million as we, are, as we define our, our poverty levels. There should be some way in which these two can be synthesized. And I would welcome your views on that. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me another chance. Uh, you had very briefly mentioned on the gender differences in terms of, in relation to happiness. 
As a sociologist, I'm quite keen on it. And I just want to share some observations which I have, although on a lighter note, but I do have some more research on it too, is that uh, across cultures, across ages, uniformly one sees that when the joke is on men, it's women who laugh. And when the joke is on women, it's uh, men who laugh. And you never see the reverse kind of thing. Uh, but a joke like that always brings a smile and laughter. And my thing which I want to, how would you connect the laughter therapy with pursuit of happiness and well-being, which is also being now pursued by various corporates and well-being uh, workshops, and how successful it is? Thank you. I have many, but I'll just to re leave it to one. Uh, you noted that 80% uh, uh, is genetic. We could argue about that. But if that's the case, and you believe it, that means there's only 20% that is in flux. And you've given us three different uh, ways that we can change it. Can you give us some percentage of all of this? Because you focused, and the, 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 the final uh, uh, the discussion point was that it's free enterprise and that's going to solve our problems. But what percentage of that last 20% is really related to that? And how do, you, how do you deal with that in a country where 400 million are poor and which is riddled with caste, a, a note that no one has made use of, where people are born into and die in a particular social structure where there is no mobility? where mobility is severely limited. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly through the, I think, what are, what are the main points of what we've talked about. Um, do we need balance within oneself? Of course. Of course. I mean, ultimately, this is, this is what we're seeking. Uh, and you can be completely out of balance by engorging one thing over, over all other things. And I want to emphasize, because I didn't, I didn't raise a minute ago, and it was uh, something that somebody, somebody brought up. I mean, and, and it was something that you raised, too. Um, free enterprise is not the only solution to all happiness. Free enterprise is what I emphasized in this talk, because I was explaining why my institution exists. But I could perfectly well be the president of the traditional family values institute. I could perfectly well be the, the, the president of, a, of an institution that promotes uh, uh, intercultural understanding through interfaith dialogue. And all of these things would be good either engorged beyond limit and create great harm or do really good things for happiness as well. So free enterprise is not the only solution. It's one tool that leads typically to a great deal of life satisfaction through the institutions of meaning, success, and control. It's not intended as the only thing that will patch us all the way from 80% to 100%. Now, the, the research says that between 50 and 80%, it doesn't really matter. We need to make the right policy decisions and the right personal decisions. So that's simply one, one element that I wanted to, re, that I wanted to raise. Um, th so I don't want you to walk away saying, all I care about is free enterprise. That's one thing that I think is, is a, a salutary thing to do. Now, it, related to, to free enterprise, um, how is it, compatible uh, with the, the realities in a country that has a lot of poor people. On a second, I'm gonna, my colleague Sadanan is going to just say a, a word or two. I'm going to call on him to say a word or two because he's, he's Indian and has thought a lot about these things too. And, and I'm gonna, I don't want to go outside my realm of expertise. But I will say that there's no indication that free enterprise d doesn't help the least among us. It raises jobs. It creates growth. It creates opportunity, and it destroys social systems that hold people down for reasons of class. It's a merit-based system that does more harm to social class than anything else. That's the reason that people who believe in social class and caste above all others hate free enterprise. That's the reason that royalists in Europe hate the free enterprise system is because they can't stand a common man becoming a rich man. They hate that. It seems morally wrong. There's nothing more subversive to the idea of class than the free enterprise system that really truly does reward merit. So I'll, I'll pose that to you, and I realize that it's not an uncontroversial thing. Uh, and and um, again, thank you for your disagreement in advance. Um, how do you synthesize an open system to get a successful India? How do you balance openness 
with inclusiveness. Sadanan Dume. Thanks, Arthur. Um, let's talk about being put on the spot. Um, I haven't done much research into, uh, into happiness, but I'll just sort of encapsulate what I think are some of the lessons from um, Indian history on this question. The first is that, yes, there is great poverty, and there has been great poverty for a long time, and it remains. But when we look at historical trend lines, and if you look at the past 60-odd years of Indian history, uh, I think the consensus right now, there's debate going on, but the consensus among serious people, there's a new book out uh, last month, you might have heard of, Patrick French wrote a book. The consensus is that over the past 20 years, India has done more to lift more people out of poverty faster than over the first 40. So yes, much of there is a problem and there's much, there's much distance to be, the, to be covered still, but the political economy question is that as India has liberalized, it has made a deeper dent into poverty. Much more needs to be done, but it has made that deeper dent over the past 20 years compared to the previous 40, first of all. So it's a process, and if things continue in the current path, poverty will continue to be reduced. And the key there is to not reduce the opportunities that business and, and business has and entrepreneurs have to create wealth and to create jobs and so on. The second thing comes to Arthur's point about when you're at a very low level of income, in fact, uh, wealth does lead to happiness. And I think India would be a classic case where you do need the government, for example, to be looking at basic things, can it, can it provide basic and drinking water, sanitation, uh, schools, infrastructure. Uh, there, that, that, that sort of comes down to the question of, of, of inclusive growth. How you do it is a different question, but I don't think that uh, there would be much argument that in a country like India, people need to focus on that 25% of the population that people agree that 25% of the population has not benefited tremendously over the past 20 years, and that is a public policy challenge, and it's a, it's a moral challenge uh, to, to, to do that. So I, I, I hope that sort of partially answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhana. There's, there's one minor issue that I didn't raise, which is how do we deal with, how do we decondition the mind of bureaucrats such that they understand that that social control, control over the economy, and a complete lack of risk is the path to happiness, which we, in point of fact, know is no, not to be the case. Um, I think that a better strategy, public policy strategy, that we pursue at the American Enterprise Institute is not to decondition the mind of the bureaucrat, it's to decommission the bureaucrat himself. <laughs> and ultimately, I think we can get a better social uh, aims met that way. Great. Very good. Uh, I think we will, please, if you don't mind, uh, stop here. Uh, I want to thank all of you for having been a superb audience. I would not have anticipated, truth to tell, that we would give the range and the quality of issues that all of you have raised. I particularly want, obviously, to thank our speaker, uh, not just for everything he has talked about and the issues he's raised, but also in the masterly way in which he has dealt with the issues that have been raised from the floor. Uh, I could not help but observe that what you chose to do with each question was to go to its core and address the issue and not sometimes the somewhat contentious terms in which the issue might have been framed. I think that's a masterly way of handling issues and questions. You know, at the Aspen Institute, we are very much committed to the process of dialogue. Uh, moderation also. We are the mullahs of moderation, you know, and, and there is Mr. Basu with a, with a notebook, you know, he's going to mark me out on the things that I didn't do properly. But we also really believe that it is the quality of dialogue and interaction that takes place when fine thinkers come to us and give us an opportunity to put up issues that bear reflection. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Professor Brooks for having given us a very profitable uh, Friday morning. 
um, when so many others would be busy with so many other activities. Thank you very much for attending this function. Thank you, sir.